Okay, it looks like uh, folks are still coming in, but we will go ahead and get started um, in just a minute because I'm watching that number tick up and I want to make sure we, we don't start before everyone's settled. Um, welcome. So nice to see all of you. Just a couple of logistics as people are arriving. Um, if you would like to select closed captioning, I will mention this one more time, um, but you may go to the bottom menu and click on the CC button for a live transcript. And then also, if you have questions during the presentation, you're welcome to place them in the Q&A and we'll make sure to watch for those um, and review them uh, as we can during uh, the presentation or after the presentation rather. Okay, so I think we'll get started. I see a few more folks are still coming in, um, but I wanna make sure we give Lynn as much time as possible. So um, I'll get us started. Welcome everyone. My name is Anna Truxis and I'm the executive director of the Portland Chinatown Museum. Thank you for joining us today for our profound engagement artist talk with Lynn Yarn. Before we get started, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The Portland Chinatown Museum acknowledges and honors the indigenous peoples and their descendants of the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region, whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlemet, Malala, Multnomah, and Motlala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the many other Chinookan peoples who established communities along the Lower Columbia, whose descendants are today members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs, and Siletz Confederated Tribes of Oregon. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the artist who um, is with us today, who we're so pleased to have with us today. Today's presentation is the second program in a new Portland Chinatown Museum artist talk series made possible in part by a generous grant from Neighbors West, Northwest, and the City of Portland Office of Community and Civic Life. We are so pleased to welcome back Lynn Yarn, who you might remember from our Descendant Threads exhibition in 2018. Her installation piece, Alter, appeared alongside works by Roberta Wong and Ellen George, curated by Horatio Law. Alter was a powerful testament to the strength and love found in the stories and memories of the families and people who have lived and worked in Portland's Chinatown and Japantown. And we cannot wait to hear more about what she has been working on since then. Lynn is an artist and educator from Portland, Oregon. She works with animation and collage to address collective memory, generational narratives, histories, and space. A fifth and fourth generation Chinese and Japanese American, her current work explores themes of displacement and loss, resilience and community, particularly within Old Town Portland. She wonders about the capacity for art to engage and create stakeholders, to actively involve people in repair and visionary thinking. She is curious about participatory works, magic and rejuvenation. And we're so pleased to have you here today. Lynn, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thank you so much for having me, um, especially Kapiolani for putting this all together. I know that's a lot of work um, and Anna. Um, I have a lot of images, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Uh, I selected this image because I found it in my classroom where I teach and I think it's Michael Jackson, but someone suggested that it might be me. And so I kind of chose this image to hype myself up because it's like, what if I had a great belt, like belt buckle and um, awesome hair. So I'm hoping that maybe there's something that you might connect with that also might hype you up too. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, when I go into a space or a meeting, I kind of generally like to know what's gonna happen just cause I'm a little anxious that way. So this is kind of my rundown of how I organize things. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about family and interest in Old Town, um, talking about past works, especially through mythology and kind of thinking about mythology as a guide to how to live well, um, studying engagement, and Linspirations, different projects that I'm really excited about. Um, as a way to, I'll talk about the Leah Hing mural that I'm working on right now. Um, 
I thought I'd start with family because this is kind of my lens through which I view a lot of things. Um, also, I've figured a lot of my aunties or people I know are here, um, and you might know my parents. Um, this is me up there in the pink, and my dad is Jeff Yarn. He's probably the friendliest person I know. And my mom is Kathy Yarn or Kathy Saito. She's a twin, so that's my Auntie Carol over there. Um, if you've talked to either of them recently, you've probably met or heard about Rafa or Raphael, who is the seven month old son of my brother, Brian and his partner, Lucy. And I come from a really big family on my mom's side, which is the Saito side of the family. Um, so I have a lot of cousins and that's me up there in the corner. I am a fourth generation Japanese American and fifth generation Chinese American. And most of my family or kind of grandma's sides at least um, lived in the Chinatown, Japantown neighborhood or nearby. And I never lived in Chinatown, but um, something that you may or may not relate to is like, going down to Chinatown a lot when I was a kid and eating around big tables with people and family and then also um, like Sundays at Fang Chong or at Golden Horse, and then having the whole room full of people who are doing the same thing, like eating with family or friends, and then you kind of visit people's tables and you kind of know other families or meet people. Um, after going to Fang Chong, we'd usually like get hanbao or go grocery shopping and like stare at the ducks in the window um, or get ha flakes. And so I think for me, um, Chinatown kind of represents this togetherness and uh, celebration. Um, right now, Chinatown's really different looking. It's not a place that I go to as often. And so I have a lot of wonderings about Chinatown as an area. Um, and thinking about this kind of stakeholdership or these kind of warm feelings of community or um, history or family lore and family connection. Um, I'm really curious about all the different kind of stories that Chinatown or Japantown or Old Town in general houses. Um, you know, Chinatown, of course, is indigenous land, and I'm going to refer to it as Chinatown, but it's also, um, you know, there's many different ways to draw a border around it or to think about this space. Um, it's indigenous land. There's a lot of queer and LGBTQT history um, that overlaps Chinese American history. Um, it's where Japantown or Nihonmachi was. Um, also, we can think about uh, Jewish history, Roma history, Italian history, um, Black history. Um, moving on to the next portion. Uh, this morning I was catching up on news and thinking a lot about like, what am I even gonna say today that relates to anything that's happening right now? Um, and I think that I hope everyone's taking care of themselves and doing okay. Um, the past body of work that I'm gonna talk about started out just as like kind of private work for myself to power up and think about um, how to power myself in times when I felt a little powerless or like I didn't have a way to influence the world around me. Um, I was thinking a lot about kind of the statues I grew up with. My grandma collected Kuan Yin statues, um, big and small ones. Um, and they're kind of all over the house or like kitchen gods or kind of different um, goddesses are always around. Um, and so I'm thinking about how to live well or kind of stories that guide me. Um, I also thought about like how you don't really have to look that far and you don't have to look into outer space to find examples of um, people that you wanna channel or um, ways of living that you wanna channel. Um, so I started to try and combine these ideas of people and family members and friends and like things I admire into um, kind of these god goddess images. And I was thinking of them at the time as a personal catalog of goddesses. Um, so this is one that was shown in the Descendant Threads exhibit. Um, it's my great grandmother as the thousand hand Kuan Yin. <laughs> I was really interested in the kind of lore of the stories and like I though I never knew her um like part of her story was a lot of people told me that she took them in when they were little or that she taught herself how to read in Cantonese and English um she her husband died when she was in 
maybe her 20s or 30s. And so she was a single mother raising several kids um, using skills like cooking or sewing. Um, around this time, my grandmother on my Japanese side of the family or my mother's mother passed away, Grandma Fumi. Um, and if you knew her, she was really quiet, but she had this kind of like subtle smiling thing that she would do where she was always thinking about stuff, but maybe not always telling you. Um, and so I was thinking about her as a powerful person in my life as well. Um, I was also thinking about like in creating these animations, um, really like mythologizing them and making them part of like my own personal religion in a, a way. Um, I was trying to do a series with my parents' wedding photos to try and recreate their wedding um, via small animations. Um, these are my aunties and grandmas making wedding food. <laughs> And then in trying to think about how to display these, I was thinking about like, well, where, where would I worship these goddesses or gods? Um, so I made an altar space. And this was um, first shown at the Descendant Threads exhibition in the Chinatown space um, with Roberta Wong and Ellen George. Um, inside the space, sorry, I'm trying to look for the arrow button. Um, there are audio recordings of interviews with different elders, um, and then these framed photos represent uh, different moments of stories um, in those interviews, and then the kind of collaged walls of the space are family photos, including Clyde Drexler over there. I think the part of that process that I found the most interesting um, was during the exhibition, having people go inside the space and then point out their own relatives or tell me stories about um, things that they saw or um, find connections that I didn't really know about. And I loved that idea of like um, creating a little area where people ex are exchanging stories or holding questions and um, community together. Um, at the time, I was thinking a lot about community, especially, you know, thinking about Chinatown as um, Japantown, right? And like this narrative of a community that was once together and really close and kind of thriving in certain ways, despite a uh, policy that was oppressive um, and then being suddenly separated. Um, I think right now with Portland changing so much and uh, especially Old Town and Chinatown, um, I've been thinking about relationships between community and space, um, but also community and story. And so I was thinking a lot about community memory, um, having overlaps in memories or overlaps in stories that kind of create this idea of togetherness or um, belonging. Um, in this process, I think I spent a little bit more than a summer, about like a year, um, interviewing different people. And that was probably my number one favorite thing about it was listening to people's stories. Um, I recorded a lot of the stories and were able to put a lot of them into the altar. Um, some I'm still working with. Um, I'm gonna play just a clip of this one. Um, this is a, from an interview with Jean Matsumoto, Miss Jean. Um, she, was talking about her memories and camp being kind of a child, um, but contrasting those memories now with what she knows about internment camp or like what her parents went through. I also visually wanted to contrast photos of people who were interned or incarcerated, because um, a lot of them are posed photos where people are smiling and look very happy. Um, and I think there's kind of a 
an interesting juxtaposition between like um, the experiences that people have being positive or negative, um, photos of people being oftentimes very positive. The things that were really, really bad in the assembly setting, which is like four, yeah, in the camps, I didn't realize that I took them out of my head. And I cannot remember. You know, when you're eight, seven, eight, nine, eight, ten years old, you could always find fun things to do. And you don't remember that mom had to sweep dust out the barracks apartment every day because of the dust storms in Idaho. And you forget about the below zero freezing weather with the ice forming inside. There's so many photos out there of um, funerals at camps, but then there's so few stories that I've heard firsthand or secondhand even of, of funerals or people dying. Um, so that's something I'm always curious about. The things that were. Um, this one is, I'm gonna talk about Leah Hing a little bit later, but um, I made kind of like a, I don't know, like a promo reel for her band, um, which was an all American, Chinese American girl band um, in the 1920s. My understanding was that they had one song, which was Happy Days Are Here Again. Um, I think in thinking about like how much I really enjoyed listening to people's stories, I wanted to just structure that experience for other people or like try and give that experience to other people. So it opened Signal in, I think the summer of 2019 or so. Um, I did a human library project, which isn't a concept I created. Um, I think other people have done something similar, but it was supposed to be a human library, kind of like where instead of checking out a book, you can check out a person's experience or kind of learn from another person. Um, so we had Miss Jean, um, Chisao Hata, um, Lynn Grannon, and uh, Martha Matsushima from Onsen, um, who were all kind of aunties. I also think a lot about my own aunties and kind of the stories and experiences that I have learned from. Um, and so it was a way that people could come in and um, also talk and converse. Um, recently, I've been trying to learn about public artwork. It's just something I'm really curious about, especially in thinking about Old Town and um, different places having memories or stories that we can't see but exist for a lot of people. Um, I did this project in Seattle and it's a series of five different sites um, in Lake City, Seattle. Um, this one is about the renaming of Hayashi Avenue. So it was a Japanese American farm um, where the family was forcibly removed. And so there's little kind of placards with a scannable QR code. Um, and then I made visual kind of three-dimensional looking um, projections of interpretations of people's stories. I interviewed about 20 something people to uh, have different voices around different stories. And then um, the interviews are on a website that I created to form a kind of an audio walking tour as you go through the neighborhood to visit the different sites. Um, during pandemic, I was trying to work on something similar for Old Town, and I might pick it up again, but I was trying to start with Anzen. Um, Anzen was in Japantown or Chinatown, and it was one of the oldest grocery stores. And I think when I was growing up, it was a place that I went to, like if we were going for um, Japanese ingredients, it had kind of everything, like this is what the shelves looked like, like a whole bunch of types of miso and also 
video rentals and statues. Um, they eventually moved to MLK, which is now like a weed store. Um, the way I create these is by getting photographs and then cutting them apart and kind of patching them up again. Um, so this was the fish case at Anzen. And then this is kind of the AR experience, but it's in a video form, so you can't really see it in 3D as well. Not really sure what I think about AR, but I really like the idea of like, maybe not trying to make things real, but um, like when things are kind of pulling in and out of being real, um, like how the signs float off or like when kind of AR images overlap, they get kind of weird or like intersect in funny ways. Um, I'm always kind of curious about that in ideas around memory um or stakeholdership um thinking about stories i also just kitchen talk is always kind of my model of story exchange that i'm really interested in um this is a picture from Mikoinokai, and i love when everyone has like a little job to do and then even if you don't have a job somebody's going to give you a job or you know you're supposed to be doing something and there's kind of an organic ex exchange of ideas um so my next section is studying engagement I don't think I'm an expert by any means, but as a classroom teacher in a public high school, I get a lot of feedback and opportunity um, where I'm working with teenagers uh, like nine through 12th grade, and they will definitely show me when they're bored or if something's not working. Um, it's easy to see when engagement's falling apart. And I think as an artist, there's a lot of times where people are talking about community engaged work or socially engaged work in the arts. Um, but I'm like, what is that? What does that mean or what does that look like? Um, how, what kind of structures do artists create or um, do artists create that exclude sometimes um, to either invite or reject authentic engagement? Um, this was kind of like an initial brainstorming about like what does working with people even mean? Um, is it something like asking prompts? Is it making something together? I think a lot of people think about like murals where everybody's painting um, or is it directly fundraising for something where you're giving money or purchasing something from? Um, is it just getting together in general? I think, you know, during quarantine, there's a lot of moments where people are thinking about being together, being apart. Um, so I thought I'd share like a couple kind of projects working with people um, and how how I've worked with people and but again like I think of it more as a study not like I'm an expert in it. Um, this was a study in community just kind of thinking about what is community it's a question I've been holding for more than 10 years formally. Um, it's a project I did with high schoolers on the west side of Chicago and I'll just play a, kind of a clip of this video um, in the project. I worked with teenagers to come up with research questions with them. And then in small groups, they created uh, video investigations and video research on their topics around community. And so originally we mapped things and word associations and then came up with questions from those mappings. I found that a lot of people, whereas it's hard to um, talk about what community is, I think a lot of people are able to talk about what community isn't. Um, and thinking about community is often having kind of uh, 
dangerous ways of excluding, but in a really positive way, uh, or not, not it's, that it's positive to exclude, but it's framed positively. Um, these were some of my kind of just general questions around community. I think a lot of times in the classroom, we talk about building community as if it's something um, that you can facilitate when oftentimes I sometimes wonder if it's just something people feel. Um, this was a project um, in partnership with the Hollywood Senior Center and the digital media program that I created at Grant. Um, the first one was called Wise Women Say, um, and then the second one was around the theme of empowerment. And so in small groups, uh, high school students from my class who were learning video skills and video editing skills partnered with elders from Hollywood Senior Center, which is a pretty amazing place. Um, the first kind of set of videos, which I think we came up with 16 videos as a film festival, um, were on life lessons. And then the second round we did um, stories about empowerment. Um, some of them were scripted like this one in the corner. Um, this guy wrote like a whole script that he wanted to reenact in little vignettes. Um, whereas this one down here um, was like a, not performance piece, but they went to different grocery stores to try and engage with strangers in positive ways. Um, some of them were more around interview questions and sourcing people's experiences. Um, Joyfest 2015 or 16, 18, and I think I did one more version of it, um, was a festival in which students brought joyful activities um, as class finals to think about how to think about joy in educational spaces, um, also to try and think about experiencing joy with one another. Um, I'm an advisor for the GHS Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, which really looks different every year. It's a student-led club, um, but thinking about engagement as a way to empower younger leadership um, is something I'm really curious about. Um, something that we did recently with Janine Shinoda, Amisa Chu, and Jacqueline Nakashima um, was the Strawberry Social with Ikoinokai um, Senior Lunch Program. And it was kind of a strawberry festival, um, thinking about a lot of people in the community who have experienced either growing strawberries, farming strawberries, or picking strawberries, um, and a history that's not really talked about, or even, you know, Japanese American um, like super influence in strawberry culture and farming historically um, is something that's not really put out there. And so we wanted to celebrate strawberries and think about eating them together, but also as a structuring some storytelling around it. Um, Jacqueline is like the super awesome pastry chef and she made all these desserts and snacks. Um, I did a screen printing workshop where we screen printed tenugui um, and a lot of different people came. So I think the direction of my work that I'd like to take is something where there's some collaboration um, and storytelling, but that maybe we can kind of channel some of that like kitchen talk vibe. Um, and then the last project I'm gonna talk about in this section is in 2016 with my students, um, there's this really kind of ugly closet and we converted it into a screen printing studio. Um, so we got some recycled wood and kids made proposals about what kind of things they'd like to see, for example, like a drying rack that's also an herb garden, um, which was really complicated because there wasn't a lot of windows in the dark room. Um, and so something I'm thinking about is just uh, providing tools as a way to engage with students or engage with young people um, and just thinking about the kinds of things that they want to make. Um, there's been a couple fundraisers. This is the second year we've done one for Blanchet House. I've always wanted to make a giant check to present. Um, so that was the first year I got to do that. Um, this was another fundraiser we did with Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. Okay, so now is the Linspirations section um, where I'm just really excited to share some projects I've seen recently. Um, during the pandemic, there's a lot of projects that happened around Chinatowns all over the country. Um, and I kind of wanted to put them out there as a just getting pumped. Um, 
there's a lot of things like workshops or people starting to organize um, community safety warnings or like ways that people, um, vaccination help clinics, um, fundraising. I'm really obsessed with Wing On Wo and Co. It's a fifth generation Chinese American uh, porcelain shop in New York Chinatown. And I think it's one of the oldest, oh, oldest operating store in New York, um, Chinatown. And they have beautiful kind of graphic design and things. They also have a really cool, it's called the Wow Project, um, where they're doing kind of arts and culture programming. Um, some of this programming is kind of getting together and talking. Um, there's artist residencies, um, including uh, things around recycling, um, art making together. Uh, there's a window display artist residency. Um, this one is around like New Year's and the idea of sweeping away evil and what does that mean? Um, they did a project during pandemic called Love Letters to Chinatown in which people wrote love letters to Chinatown or to Chinatown restaurants or different businesses. And then those letters were posted um, on the outside of buildings. Um, Welcome to Chinatown is another organization that's in New York. Um, something that they've done, like you can see community self-defense workshops. Um, something that I really like too is like this kind of business map but also they had local graphic designers design things for local businesses to fundraise. Um, I really want a golden horse t-shirt. And so if you are a graphic designer or know somebody who is and would like to start something like that, I'd be really excited to do something in that kind of vein. Um, Humbaus Not Hotels is out of Seattle. And this one, you know, I think something that will probably face in Portland Chinatown is um, larger hotels or larger buildings being built. Um, and so this organization, I think, has especially been trying to connect to housing justice um, and different uh, ways to advocate for um, residents and small businesses in the international district. Um, this one Kapiolani told me about, because Kapiolani is my favorite new person that I've met most recently, um, Imagining Chinatown in 2050, a speculative futures workshop. And so people did writing workshops around future Chinatown 2050. And then these writings were put into short stories um, as a short story collection, and then also created an AR. Um, also, this one isn't Chinatown specific, but just, I think, an awesome Thing that I've been trying to keep track of the last few years, the Albina Vision Trust. Um, so thinking about what is the future of Albina. And I loved these kind of core values that are outlined. I think a lot of times revitalization uh, talks are around business or making money, um, which money of course needs to happen. Um, but also I love that arts are in there, or like, I love that part about being remarkable or healing. Um, this is my last section. Uh, so the Leah Hing mural, um, I was trying to think of all those sections as a way to talk around and talk about my current project. Uh, Leah Hing is, or was a pilot in Portland and she was the first Chinese American pilot to earn her pilot's license. Um, she, let's see, in this era, she worked with this guy, Tex Rankin, who was training pilots, and he trained, I think, five different pilots of different ethnicities, which is kind of, kind of weird, but kind of interesting, too. Um, so there was an Indigenous pirate, pilot, um, a Black pilot, um, Leah, and she wasn't in the war, she... Um, I think just trained as a pilot. Um, she grew up on a hop farm, as did Lil, her life partner. And this is just a really cute picture of her and her playing later in her life. Um, I think as I mentioned earlier with that little animation, um, she was part of an all Chinese American girl band that traveled around the country. Um, 
and they played Happy Days Are Here Again and then played at different venues. I've been reading on that time in her life and some of the traveling times, it kind of sounds like she would play like four different shows or four um, multiple shows in a day. And that's her with the saxophone. Um, she is my grandma's cousin, I think, or um, I am related in a way. And so I think this is Leah up here. I don't know if any of you remember my uncle George up there. Um, this mural that I'm working on is going inside the Portland building. Um, there's a Leah Hing conference room, which is the largest conference room in the Portland building. And it's a really kind of a, a little bit ugly space in that it's very long and it has a really loud carpet. So I was trying to find a way to make the wall have a little bit more presence. Um, it'll go off the wall in some sort of capacity. Um, in thinking about mythologies, I was thinking like, how does her story help us to live well? Or like what from Leah's history helps us right now? Um, so kind of theme ideas was I was really interested in boundlessness, um, both barrier breaking, but also the connections that inspire us to break barriers. Um, I think to emphasize this theme, I would like to, because I don't think a lot of people are actually going to be able to physically go to this mural, I think an online component might be as important as the actual physical mural itself. Um, so part of it will exist online, um, but it'll be scannable. And so imagine if you scan the photo, your phone would fill up with clouds. I was trying to think of like a dreamy feel, not like a heaven feel. Um, I really liked thinking about her connection to CACA and different organizations in Chinatown and thinking about having that feeling of Chinatown as a present place for us both with history and stakeholders and trying to convey that presence um, in front of people who make policy about the city or who make decisions about the city. I think a lot of people say or think that Chinatown moved, um, which Chinatown is still a space where a lot of people have connection to. Uh, when I was little, my grandma had this big chest and it's kind of like where she placed her snacks a lot of times, but I love the little stories and kind of carvings and you kind of imagine different things that happened within it. Um, and so I'm basing, there's gonna be five wooden placards or kind of relief pieces um, that will have little stories uh, carved into it. Um, so for example, her band or um, signage, she was a basketball coach. And so I'm making them out of clay first and then I'll digital scan them and then 3D carve them or route them. Um, so the center one will focus around themes about Leah and Leah's history, um, whereas the other four kind of pieces that I'm doing will have signage from Chinatown or different stories um, about Chinatown and the Chinese community. Um, There'll be little placards or kind of like colorful areas where you can scan to connect to content from Chinatown Live um, with the Portland Chinatown Museum or kind of short audio clips or interviews um, or historical photos. And I'm also gonna talk about a future workshop that I'm doing because I think sometimes in work about past history, I really wanna be intentional about connecting it to um, the future, how does this relate to now? I'm really curious about art as an opportunity to talk story with one another and discuss ideas, um, but also as a way to involve other people in repair and envisioning. Um, so kind of the next project that I'm trying to do um, that you guys are invited to is uh, Envisioning Lab. Um, I think for the very first pilot one, we're trying to keep it really small, especially to observe uh, COVID safety um, and thinking more specifically on the new Chinatown, Japantown Historic District. Whereas I think I'd like to broaden the conversation to larger Old Town in the future. Um, in the workshop, ideally, I was thinking 
you know, whereas I can't promise direct action on fixing Chinatown or fixing a certain aspect of it, I think the idea of just getting together and thinking capaciously about what the future could hold um, could be a really nice beginning to something. Um, so participants will come together, create a collage or sketch based on um, some envisioning that we do and some prompts, um, and then we'll present these prompts um, online on a live stream. And so this will happen, um, the in-person version, which will be an invite only portion, um, will be from one to two, and then the live stream portion will start from two to three. If you're interested in joining, because I'd love to have you aboard, um, if you could give me an email or just send me a message somehow, I'd love to connect with you. And this is my content or my contact information um, if you want to get a hold of me. Those are my slides. Thank you so much. I tried to not um, uh, bombard the chat, but there were so many incredible moments in your presentation that I, I had to do uh, a bit of that, but we really, really appreciated it. And the chat is full of lovely comments and folks that you're inspiring um, and a few questions as well. So I'll go back to that in a moment, but um, we do have a couple questions uh, to kind of go over. If it's okay, I can get started with those. Great. So one of the first questions um, that we have, and I'm just going to read it to make sure I don't miss anything is, have there been any surprises or revelations um, that you've experienced in doing your creative work, either about yourself as an artist or the histories and communities that you are working with? I think I'm balancing or trying to find a good balance between um, working with people and working solo, or I think when I originally started this body of work, it was all for myself and I had no intention of sharing it with anyone. Um, it was just like a real kind of bedroom practice. Um, and then I think when I started showing it, um, I found that maybe I'm like a gallery space isn't quite the right space for it. So I think something that I'm still really curious about is where do these things go and um, who, who do I wanna work with? Um, and how do I share these things in a way that isn't maybe just centering my own practice, but inviting more people in? Well, and I loved what you said about the mural project you're working on where you felt that that needed to be both virtual and um, physical because of the number of people that would have access to it in the Portland building. I think that's really wonderful too. Thanks. Um, so Lynn, I have a question for you. You have written very beautifully of the legacy of stories and memories associated with Portland's Chinatown and Japantown. For example, you wrote, Old Town is a very haunted place, but I like to think of it as full of guiding spirits. What are some of the ways um, that you are connecting or finding those guiding spirits? Um, and I'm asking because it's a great way to help other people connect with the guiding spirits and places that they're from or live in. Um, thanks, Kapilani. Um, I think that the story exchange is so important to me. Like I just learned so much from like what people share with me, um, formally and informally. Like I think I have so many people in my life that you know you two have included, included of course, um, who just do really interesting things or like um, act in ways that I'm like, oh, I, I'm gonna save that for myself and like channel that in my um, energy. And so I think um, I'm lucky to be able to source from so many people. I guess that's not necessarily like looking back, um, but, it, but it relates like both storytelling, looking back and then engaging with so many people looking forward. Thank you. Um, I, this actually connects to the beginning of your um, presentation. Um, you described Sundays in Chinatown and it had such a, um, an incredible kind of richness to the description and it, you know, ha not having grown up in Portland at all, 
I felt this uncanny kind of sensation of like a sort of nostalgia for something I couldn't have known. And I think that's an interesting thing that your work does elicit in a way the, you know, the, the memory that's important to you and even the medium, you know, the different media you use, right. A augmented reality or AR sometimes has that sensation. Like you said, that's like a memory. Um, and so I think that's, uh, just really powerful and it connects to this next question, which um, do you have a favorite story or memory from the work that you have done or are doing? Um, and that can be, you know, the, the family mythologies that you tell or, or even, you know, something that you've learned in your community work. Um, one story that I really love that I've heard a couple of times, but also because I have it recorded and so I just play it back to myself. <laughs> Um, Bertha Zygott, who is really involved in the museum and has done a lot of work um, with the museum and with preserving history, um, was one of the first Asian American teachers in Oregon. And I, I think about that a lot. You know, there's still not like a ton of Asian American teachers. And then I think as I'm exploring my own teacher identity, I think of someone like her who, um, you know, grew up in the Chinese community and then worked so hard to like get those jobs. And what, you know, what was that like teaching in a rural place in Oregon um, in the time period that she did? Um, so I, I think I like thinking of that and channeling those energies, especially when I'm kind of struggling myself. I'm like, I don't have it quite as hard. <laughs> Um, so Lynn, based on your experiences as an artist and educator, what is currently giving you hope or inspiration or um, what do you see in the future for Portland's Old Town, Chinatown, Japantown district? I'm really excited about the work you guys are doing at the Chinatown Museum and I think I'm so excited how so many different types of people are involved. Um, so that's been really exciting to see. Um, I'm excited about this envisioning workshop so that I could kind of glean and learn more about what other people are interested in also. Um, I think in general, I'm always interested in how history is supposed to interact with our future visions of a place or our future visions of community or ideas around community. Um, I think that um, the the work of envisioning spaces in Portland and uh, involving stakeholders isn't new work. Like there's so many interesting people doing that work right now. And it's it seems to just kind of grow and get richer. Um, like I'll find a vision trust or a Van Port Mosaic project. Um, she saw how to, I, I didn't have an image, so I forgot to make a slide for that one. Um, but I, of course, need to mention Chisao and that she's doing the Living Arts Project at JAMO, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, and that's ramping up. And so I think, um, you know, that's a very, it's happening now. Um, and all of these things, I think, will keep meshing together in really lovely ways, hopefully. Um, I love that vision for the kind of dovetailing of these efforts. Um, it, you know, from the museum's perspective, we see so many wonderful projects happening that really could dovetail together and be even more powerful. So I'm, I'm glad that you're hoping for that as well. Um, and just one more question. And then I I'd wanna also go through chat because some folks had put comments there and make sure we get to kind of uh, read those. But um, and Capulani, tell me if this is a repeat, but I think we didn't do this one um, about the histories here in Old Town. I think we uh, made... No, it looks like we skipped that one if you wanna okay, ask. Okay, I'll do it. I just didn't, I wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. So many of the histories here in Old Town and other Portland neighborhoods have um, rich histories and community networks that are complex and multi-layered. How do you find your starting point when doing collaborative community-based projects? Um, or maybe are there multiple starting points? I think sometimes I find myself feeling a pressure to like try and represent everything or like, oh, and I'm not, I'm excluding this story or excluding that story or like I'm talking about one section of Asian American history. I'm not like, am I silencing other histories? Um, 
but I also think it's really impossible to and unfair to try and be a representative of everyone and everything. Um, and no one can or should, of course. Um, so that's something I always kind of think on. Um, I think for starting points, I think based on the advice of just wise people, just starting with myself or my connections and interests and trying to go from there. I mean, it's definitely not um, all inclusive, but I think it's authentic to my process for now. I think that's a, a really great lesson for everyone to start from kind of be very um, honest and authentic about where your starting point is. Cause then, you know, you're making sure to tell kind of the story in a way that, you know, connects most to the lived experience. Um, so we are just thrilled that we were able to kind of take this walk through your process and, and your works of art and your upcoming projects with you. Uh, I have to say that the promo for the band was like a salve for me with everything that's going on. I was like, yes, you know, women powder, women, women and femme power. <laughs> um, it made me really happy. And I hope we get to see more of that in the future as your projects unfold. Um, and I just want to note that there are so many wonderful uh, supportive things in the chat, uh, folks talking about how incredible, inspirational, and spectacular your work is, uh, as well as sharing um, links to, uh, you know, your pages, Chisau's, uh work, um, and folks that are very hopeful that they'll get to see the videos again as they were uh, mesmerized by them. So really wonderful, uh, wonderful energy in the chat today as well. Yes, and Roberta um, rounding it out with a well done, Lynn. Um, so we were just thrilled to be able to do this. We hope that we will see many of you on July 10th, right, Lynn? <laughs> I just had a, a, a forgetful moment, July 10th. Um, and if not at the museum, when you can make it, um, let's see here. Uh, do we want to open it up to any other questions? Oh, Lynn, uh, we'll both be able to check out the Leah Hing mural in the Portland building. Is that accessible um, when it's done? Or can they access it online? I think it will, well, I think I'd like to make it accessible online. The murals inside the Portland building, and then it will also be inside of a conference room. So I, I don't, and the Portland building itself, I think doesn't have an opening date as far as I know. Um, for like being open to the people who work, all the people who work there. Um, so I think it'll be mostly accessible online. That's my understanding. That, that's wonderful. I think it will be important that folks can engage with it in some way because it looks so beautiful, your renderings and, and your plans for that. Um, I see too oh, from- Anna, I'll just mention, we'll make sure that we have a link to it on the website. Um, so folks who want to follow up and see the completed work can uh, go to our website to link to that once it's ready. Great. And then we have a nice contribution in the chat that says a lot of the city buildings are opening in July too. So, well, all right. Um, it was just a pleasure to hear about your process and to see your work. And we look forward to working with you in the future on the workshop and beyond. Um, I think just seeing everything you've presented today was so generative. Um, I think there will be many chances for that wonderful dovetailing and collaborative uh, energy to kind of come to being. So uh, yeah, lots more positive things in the chat. I just want to thank everyone who's here with us today for joining us as we celebrate and learn more about our local Asian American artists working in the intersections of community, history, and culture. Next month, we'll be joined by local artist Roshani Thoker, excuse me, who has been doing wonderful community-based artwork in Portland and is a cultural work manager at Apano. So if you'd like to rewatch today's uh, talk um, or share it with others, we find that many people end up seeing these talks uh, through sharing, even though many of you are here today. Um, a recording will be made available on our website at www.portlandchinatownmuseum.org by Monday, June 27th. And then I also wanted to mention, and I, I need to find where I made the note, um, 
we will provide transcripts for this presentation as well. Uh, we're working to improve upon that um, aspect of our online presence. You, you saw the uh, kind of live transcript and we can use that and provide that for later as well. Um, so I just wanna say again, thank you so much to Lynn, to Capulani for um, supporting this effort and to everyone who is here today, the wonderful comments in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you soon at the museum for the workshop uh, or even online. So uh, until then, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. <laughs> oh, while we're waiting for everyone to go, I definitely would love a Golden Horse t-shirt. <laughs>